This is the Meat and Potato Sports Show. Thanks for listening. This is the sixth episode of the show. As you may know by now, hopefully know by now, the format of the show is a weekly format where we will recap the best sports stories of the week and keep you updated on the sports world. For example, on today's show, I'm going to cover topics that occurred the week of March 19th, 2018. You ready? Strap your seatbelts. Well, let's get right into it. Okay, so we got Ty Lue stepping away from the Cavs for Cavs Cavaliers for health issues, uh, reportedly due to chest pains. So apparently, our boy LeBron's uh, bad for his health. Some would say. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Uh, it's too bad. I really hope he gets better. Um, not really too much to say here, other than like I said, I hope he gets better, and it's nothing too serious. Uh, health obviously comes before basketball, so. It is good to see that he's taking time off to recover. I'm not sure if he's coming back for the playoffs or what's going to happen with that, but you know, hopefully it doesn't affect the team too much and isn't a huge shot to their morale. Uh, some more basketball news for you. Kevin Love has returned. He is back and healthy, and he beat <laughs> the... They beat Milwaukee uh, last week, 124 to 117. Kevin Love had 18 points, seven rebounds, and he played for 20, you know, respectable 25 minutes. Not his full load, but you know, a good size load nonetheless. Uh, LeBron also had a triple double himself. So yeah, the Cavs played pretty well this game, and I, I got to be honest, the Cavs are starting to uh, look look pretty good, man. Uh, right in right in almost right in time for the playoffs, which are coming up. I'd say right around the corner is safe to say um and yeah it'll be interesting to see if they can keep this momentum going into the playoffs in other basketball news the lakers lost to the pacers 100 to 110 westbrook carmelo and their thunder lost to the celtics and westbrook caught a lot of flack for that game and that loss he shot a three ball in the last <clears throat> couple seconds around the buzzer and he missed, and announcers gave him a little bit of flack. Colin Cowherd, who's you know his resident hater, uh, gave him a lot of flack for it. And uh, I'm not surprised by that. But uh, what I am surprised by is, man, he seems to have a lot of haters, doesn't he? Is, is that just me, or I don't know? He he really seems to, for whatever reason, uh, just have a lot of haters I don't know how else to say it I mean and I'm not even a fanboy of Westbrook I think he's one of the most if not the most fun person to watch but I'm, I'm not a fanboy fanboy by any stretch so you know in my opinion it's something's pretty bad when someone who's not even a fanboy notices something that blatantly I, he seems to catch a lot of flack I don't know if that's because of the accusation he's not the best team player but man you know it Paul George and other people who play with him seem to have good things to say about the guy. And I know Durant left OKC, and that's kind of the, the big mark on Westbrook's uh, teamwork legacy, if you will. But I don't know. I mean, sometimes things don't work out, A. And B, you got two alpha males. And sometimes personalities just don't mesh, man. I've been on enough teams myself to know, uh, you know, just sometimes personalities clash, and it doesn't work. And I don't think that should be um, a black mark on his legacy or resume or ability to be a team player I, I don't know it just doesn't seem fair to me but hey that's just my two cents uh moving on to some football we got bill belichick who reportedly uh i believe it was reported by espn is making brady and gronk uh well they separated with a comma meaning uh you know them separately but individually miserable. They're both miserable. So I'm sorry, let me take that back. Belichick is making Brady, comma, Gronk miserable, was the quote. Uh, just to put that into clear light for you guys. And yeah, so I don't know. I mean, you play with you play with Belichick for that many years. I'm not surprised by this. I, I mean, I, I, is anyone else kind of tired of all the, you know, negative or like, it just seems like, all the all the news outlets or media outlets just try to throw kerosene into the Patriots fire and it's like it doesn't affect them at all and <laughs> it seems to have no effect on their play whatsoever yet they keep trying it and like creating this disharmony amongst the team 
And, you know, I, I don't doubt a lot of it's true, but at the same time, I think it's just a lot of it is media trying to make a st- something out of nothing story, as they tend to do. The old dinosaur cable news media. So, I don't know, make of that what you will. Okay, now on to some Cowboys news for my fellow Cowboys fans. So, the Cowboys acquired fullback Jameez Olawail. I don't know how to pronounce that, I'll be honest. Uh, Jameez Olawail as my closest, best guess. Uh, and a 2018 six-round pick from the Raiders for a fifth-round selection. So, it looks like the Cowboys picked up another fifth round draft pick they didn't I didn't see reported what they traded for him but I assuming I'm assuming nothing significant for that reason like I said it wasn't reported so yeah I guess that's good news uh and then moving on here oh I saw this fun little trivia fact reported I believe it was ESPN Cowboy yeah it was ESPN Cowboys are the last team to add a player to their roster you know in this free agency period my take on it is they've been completely dormant in the most part, for the most part, in off-season free agency this year, and they're pretty much asking for what I am calling the looming Des Bryant conundrum, a la Zeke situation last season. Okay, so what does that mean? What I'm saying is, last season, we clearly had the Zeke black cloud over the season, and I'm 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 going out on a limb here, and I'm somewhat, if they don't do anything about this, making the prediction that this season will be the looming Des Bryant black cloud. So once again, what do I mean by that? Okay, let's expand on that. What I mean is that in some way or another, if they do not do anything at all about Des, meaning renegotiate or trade or release, and I you know, I have nothing against the guy, but from a strictly sports view of it, something has to be done. I, I think all fans agree on that. Uh in some way or another, something has to be done, right? So my, what, I, what I'm saying is is that if something is not done at all, it will have a negative effect. So if they don't renegotiate his contract, they don't get anything for him, and his play is painfully mediocre once again this season, everyone's going to be second-guessing that decision, obviously, and saying, well, if we would have renegotiated and would have been able to get another player, things may have been different this season, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not going to jump into any other possibilities for the sake of time. I think you get the point. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm that I'm going out on a limb and I'm saying that now. So I really hope to do something about it because I I could not stand to have, and I know many other fans feel the same way. I cannot stand to have another wasted season like that when they have this much talent on the team. And really, really solid young players with great promising futures and just pissing away the season. It's it's a shame. And I don't want to see it happen two years in a row. Moving on. Speaking of Dez, there's a report, I believe, that came out of ESPN that said Dez is going to work with a wide receiver coach. We'll focus on his route running, comma, footwork. Okay. I, I don't want to be... Mr. Negative on this, but it's just, man, he's so late in his career at work on route running. His route tree is so limited. I mean, can't you only do so much at that point in time? You've lost that much speed, and I mean, how much how much quicker can you jump off your routes and get, and get better at that at his age, especially when we've seen the amount of athleticism that he's lost j- just in general? I, I don't know. I just... I'm pretty skeptical about it. I really hope for the best, obviously. But with that being said, I'm still sticking to my assertion that something needs to be done about it. And I I just really hope this isn't their way of, like, trying to convince us that them doing nothing about it is okay because he's got his nose to the grindstone on working on his routes. I, I don't know. That's the skeptic in me speaking. I'll be the first to admit it, but... I'll have to hold out and see. I mean, there's really nothing more to it. And now let's move on to the last piece of Cowboys news I have. And this is somewhat, this is somewhat, you know, better news. Definitely good news. Um, so I know I was a little bit hard on them in the last segment about them being the last player to add a roster, to add a player to their roster, excuse me. And they were 
have been a little bit dormant in the offseason free agency. But with that being said, they did acquire a couple receivers, which I was very pleased to see. One of them being Alan Hearns, who they got from, I believe, was the Jaguars, Jacksonville Jaguars. And they also picked up Deontay Thompson. So it's a couple receivers to add to their arsenal. Oh, and they also picked up the offensive tackle Cameron Fleming. But what I'm really pleased about is these two receivers. Because I'm, I'm really keeping a positive outlook on this. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm really predicting, let's say, shall we say, good things with Alan Hearns and Dak Prescott. I don't know why. I just have a gut feeling that it could be a great fit. And I'm very interested to see how that shakes out and we will not have to wait too long to see moving on moving on some more NFL news we have the New York Giants who traded JPP that's Jason Pierre Paul to Tampa Bay and it looks like as a result they will be seriously considering picking up the defensive end Chubb with their second pick I don't think it's a horrible move uh, I think it's maybe a good idea that they're swapping out JPP for a younger model, if you will. <laughs> but it, it is somewhat of risk because, you know, you had JPP who wasn't wanting for performance. and But, you know, like I said, that being said, he's 29 years old now. So maybe looking for a younger model in that position. I'm not sure what their thoughts are, but that's that. Changing gears. Let's go back to some basketball news. We had, okay, so we had Lonzo and the Lakers who lost to the New Orleans Pelicans. And I got to tell you, uh, the media did not hold someone accountable for what I believe was the loss of the game. And it was especially funny to see this after them after seeing Westbrook get railed against in multiple forms of media and outlets for basically the same thing and not even as bad. Uh, you had Lonzo Ball, who shot, I think it was the last two shots of the game, and they were both three balls. He's been shooting like, can we just say, kind of garbage from three for the last, you know, recent period of time not 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 the whole season you know he did start getting better but then he started kind of going back into this slump and he just jacked up two threes the last two shots of the game and just come both complete bricks and I think it's got it was it's gotten so bad to where for one of them there were people there were defenders on the on the Pelicans team who were standing you know I don't know 10 15 feet away he had the ball, he got set, and they, they wouldn't even press him, put any pressure on him at all. No, It's just like they're not even, a, they're not even a fr- like remotely afraid that that three ball is going to drop if it's shot from Lonzo's hands. So, I, I don't know. I it's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say where, where they go from here. I know they've put a lot of stock in him, and I think he has great potential for the future, possibly simply just because of his how tall he is for a point guard and he does show some flashes and it's funny because you hear a lot of people say that he shows flashes and that's great but for 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 them going all in on him and all this hype and all the hype that was made I'm just not sold man I'm not and I know that a lot of people are so I'll probably get a lot of flack for saying that but I, I don't care that's how I feel and you have to be honest in this in this position so I just, I just feel like you see these other rookies who were, who were playing great and there was nowhere near the amount of hype surrounding them. And, and hey, maybe that's playing into it. Maybe that's why he isn't playing as well as we thought he would or, or rather producing as much as we thought he would because he is playing great in a lot of games. I'll give him that. He really is. But it, it's just in today's NBA where there's no virtually no defense, it's really hard for me to be highly impressed or as impressed as other people are with someone who's, you know, for the last somewhat long recent past, been been scoring five to seven, eight points a game. It's really hard for me to go all in on someone that's that's having that kind of production on the offense. And his defense isn't bad, so that's to his credit. I'll give, definitely we'll give him that. His defense isn't bad at all. Uh, but you know, when you have that kind of length at point guard, that's kind of how you should be because you're 
a lot of the time stacked up against people well, well below your height. So I don't know, make of it what you will. That's just kind of my two cents on it. I'm just, I'm kind of hedging my bets on it. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it because I'm definitely, definitely not nowhere near saying he, he's a bust in terms of his future and he will be a bust. But as I stated before, and I believe the first show that, you know, what we were sold on based on the standards of what we were sold on up until this point, it, it has been a bust. I don't think there's any way around that. And I, I hope the best for him. I really hope he does well, especially since I'm a Lakers fan. I hope he does well, but I'm also not going to make excuses for him like so many others seem to do, namely Skip Bayless and these other commentators. And I, I just, I can't do that. I can't make excuses for, for someone like that. It's just not in my nature, which in my humble opinion is to the audience's benefit at the end of the day. Moving on, let's downshift back to some NFL news. So the NFL committee, rules committee, is discussing changing the NFL catch rule, which I'm sure brings joy to everyone who hears this. And yeah, I think that's a great thing. It it got way too confusing for fans, uh, for, let's be honest, officials. It got way too confusing for everyone involved in the NFL and the game. So to see that change uh, coming down the pipeline, which seems like a near certain thing is a very good thing and I can't imagine the rule the rule change being any worse than it is now so (laughs) you you can't lose when you hear that in my opinion I was really glad to hear that let's change to so so that's all we're sorry so that's all we're going to say on that for now um when we hear more about it and if it is made official we'll go more in depth into it, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on something that isn't a hundred percent certain yet. Like I said, it's about ninety eight, ninety nine percent. But you get, you get, you get my point. You get my point. Okay, so let's move on to some prospect news. Okay, we got Sam Darnold who had his pro day, and I think it was all good for old Sam Goody, old Sam Goody Darnold. He. He, it was, it was, it was reported that he, it was possible to rain or something like that. And they were, he, he was like concerned and wanted to make sure he was really eager and was like something to the effect of, well, if it rains, I'm still going to be able to throw. Right. Right. Like really eager, which is really good for teams looking at him. I think that really, really makes teams happy that are seriously considering taking him. And I think in all in all, his pro day only served to raise his draft stock, if anything. And I think it did, personally. I think it raised his draft stock and showed teams what he was made of, that he is he is a tough mutter and not afraid to get down and dirty. And he just seems like a like a like a tough like he's gonna be a tough player, a mutter who's not afraid to get to get take some hits and make some good decisions in the NFL. He seems like a smart kid in addition to his physical attributes. And I think that says a lot in terms of what his potential will be when he reaches the league. And then your favorite, your next favorite prospect, Baker Mayfield. They're saying his draft stock is looking really good. He he's, surpassed from what I've been told Josh Rosen's draft stock and people are liking him more than Josh Rosen for a couple reasons uh one of them is Josh Rosen's durability and escapability seems to be inferior to that of Baker Mayfield's and I think that's hurt Rosen's stock a little bit and I kind of I kind of get that I gotta say um Nothing against nothing against the kid, but I have to say that does compute with me. And you know, he's kind of he kind of reminds me of like a like a Matt Stafford, or he could see he could he could be like a Matt Stafford, in my opinion. And it's like how Skip Bayless calls, I believe him, like a scarecrow in the pocket. He's just you know not not he's been hurt. Uh, referring to Rosen, he's been hurt. He's not a hundred percent durable, and I think in today's NFL that's pretty important. Granted. You know the quarterback position is protected 
amply, I mean, very well today in terms of rulings and rules. And yeah, they're protected, but they still get hurt. I mean, look at Aaron Rodgers. He's been hurt a few times. And granted, he is mobile. So he's somewhat, you know, mobile, uh, well, respectably mobile, I'd say. So I guess that comes with the territory. But still, there are even our guys who are pocket passers that, that get hurt. So I think, you know, that team seeing that and kind of agreeing with that have kind of come to the same conclusion I have. And I think the fiery nature of Baker really, really turns teams on to the fact of how he's hungry. He's hungry to win. He's hungry to play. I think he genuinely does love the game. And really the only negative mark you can have on him is those those mistakes in his past, which I know Colin Cowherd likes to conflate and turn into this huge thing. And there's been comparisons between him and Manziel that I personally feel are really unfair because their characters are completely different when you really get down to it. And his teammates all have great things to say about him, meaning Baker Mayfield. And I know there were some who had nice things to say about Manziel, but to me, just the whole locker room seems, seemed to love Baker at Oklahoma. And I think that really says something about a person. So I don't know. I could be completely wrong. Um, I hope I'm not just for the sake of his future and his career in the NFL, but it does happen. So I'll be the first to admit it. If I am. So let's move on to our last story, a big story, in my opinion, of the show. So ESPN released a list of the top 20 most dominant athletes from what was the date range? Yeah, thanks. I believe I believe it was nine it was ninety-five to two thousand something. Oh no, I'm sorry, I correct myself. I believe it's actually ninety-eight to 2018 because it's the 20 most dominant athletes of the past 20 years so i believe that's right okay so 98 to 2018 because that would be 20 yeah okay so 98 to 2018 the, the 20 most dominant athletes in that time span and a lot of people had problems with the list uh, i gotta be honest myself included and i think that's kind of expected with any kind of top anything list top 20 top 5 top 10 whatever the whatever the number is there's always going to be problems with it, but in my opinion, the problems with the list were glaring, I mean, really just stick right in the right in front of your face problems that there's really no looking past, and the list was produced by ESPN, like I said, and their argument is, oh, well, we use this algorithm, this what they call a foolproof algorithm or something to that effect, and, you know, that, that that's how we arrive at this list. Yeah, there it is, backed by foolproof math, to quote them as how they describe their system for coming up with this list. And so, okay, how about we do this? I'm going to read you what they have listed for how they came to this list and their methodology for it. I'll read it as quickly as I can because it's a pretty good-sized paragraph. Okay, quote, We used our unpatented five-step process to determine the most dominant athletes of the past 20 years. First, we looked at the top league in every sport that has global annual revenues of $100 million or more, and for which there are reliable annual overall rankings or ratings of individual athletes for all or most of the past 20 years. Then, we rated those sports athletes in each of the past 20 regular seasons by the single best performance metric available, adjusted these ratings to normalize athlete scores in each sport across time, narrowed our focus to the top four athletes each year in every sport, then adjusted the data again to put these players across sports on a common baseline. Then we added up the results to achieve this list, in which one, open quotes, dominance share, close quotes, equals one standard deviation of performance by an athlete beyond the top four players in his or her sport for one season, close quotes for the paragraph. So what does this mean? I I don't know. I don't know. I, I got to tell you, like, okay, I, I do understand it, but <laughs> I do understand it. But with that being said, I think it's a little bit silly 
and because when I read you this list, I know you'll have problems with it too. So they can they can come up with all the algorithms and all the cool stat nerd systems they they want to, but at the end of the day, if the list doesn't resonate with people, I mean, how valuable is the list to begin with, and how great was your system to do it in the first place? So from a mathematical and an algorithmic standpoint, I understand how they compiled it and you know how they set out to make this list, but at the same time, the list is so cockeyed that I just can't take it seriously, and it brings, in my opinion, their method for doing so and into question. So, okay, let, 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 let's go through this list together. We'll start at number one. Uh, and that's another thing. They should have, in my opinion, started at 20. But what, whatever. That's beside the point and the least of our worries at this point with this list. Okay, number one, Tiger Woods. You know, so, now granted, there are some in here that make sense and their placement makes sense. So, Tiger Woods, number one. I'm going to go through this quickly because there's 20 of them. Okay. Fair enough? Fair? Yes, fair. Okay, number one, Tiger Woods, dominance rating, 17. LeBron James, 2, dominance rating, 15.6. Peyton Manning, dominance rating, 12.7. Jimmy Johnson, 12.1. Roger Federer, 10.6. Annika Sorenstam, 10.3. Michael Schumacher, 10.2. Floyd Mayweather, number 8, 10.1. Marta, women's soccer, 9.8. Usain Bolt, 9.5. Lionel Messi, 8.9. Serena Williams, 8.9. Lauren Jackson, 8.3. Cristiano Ronaldo, 8.2. Novak Djokovic, 8.0. Allison Felix, 7.3. Barry Bonds, 7.1. Mike Trout, 7.1 as well. Manny Pacquiao, 6.5. Tom Brady, at number 20, 6.3. Okay. So right off the bat. Right off the bat. Anyone see any problems with that? Yeah, me too. You got Tom Brady at the bottom of the list and Peyton Manning near the top. Not saying Peyton Manning didn't deserve to be on the list, but the fact that, that he somehow leapfrogged Tom Brady on the list and on top of that by a huge chunk in the numbers. Tom Brady's in last place on the list, number 20. And you got Peyton Manning near the top? The top? With Tom Brady at the bottom? Yeah, you got Peyton Manning in the top three of the list. And Tom Brady at number 20? Uh, I, it, may, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> like I said, from a mathematical standpoint, it does. But I believe, just, I believe that just means and proves that their system that they use is is flawed. I don't think there's one person, one football fan in the world who if you ask them which player had a more or has cuz he's still playing <laughs> successful NFL career, Tom Brady or Peyton Manning, I I truly truly do not believe one person in the world would say Peyton Manning. He had a great great career. He was one of the best of all time, Peyton Manning. But it's just ridiculous to me to have him at three and Tom Brady at 20. And that's really hard for me to look past. And I'm not even a Patriots fan. So some other issues people had. And uh, Peter Keating is the one who came up with this list, I believe. And he wrote a follow-up article kind of responding to the biggest questions people uh, had about the list. Kind of like I have. And you can see that for yourself. Uh, just look for an article by Peter Keating. The name of the article is The Biggest Questions About Our List of the Most Dominant Athletes of the Past 20 Years. Like I said, it's written by Peter Keating, the ESPN senior writer. And he addresses a few things like where's Michael Phelps? Where's Kelly Slater? Where's Kobe Bryant? How is Serena Williams not higher? Oh, and of course, why is Peyton Manning so much higher than Tom Brady? Uh... Okay, so let's kind of I'll, I'll kind of touch on the Peyton Manning and Tom Brady thing, just because that was such 
a crime, in my opinion. So his main arguments are that today's quarterback stats are inflated compared to when Peyton Manning played. Uh, quoting him, he said there were 1,000... Or no, I'm sorry, 1.72 passing touchdowns for every interception in the NFL last season, up from 1.29 20 years ago. And his other argument is Brady wasn't an automatic pro bowler, an MVP candidate until 2007. Yada, yada, yada. You, you can see his full paragraph for yourself. Uh, so, okay, I guess my, my argument against that would be right. It is an inflated passing area now. The, the The passing talent in the league, in my opinion, is better than it was when Peyton Manning played. So you have these players that Brady's going up against for MVP, and Tom Brady still won it a considerable amount of times. And how do you argue with the amount of rings he has? Not to mention the intangibles and things that don't fall into a stat sheet which is my problem with things like this and algorithms like this, which is Tom Brady, who has time and time again brought his team back from the graveyard to a victory in Super Bowl games. And not only Super Bowl games, but other games where there's moments just as important. So it's really hard for me to buy into this list, like I said, and those are kind of the main reasons, but, you know... I'm curious to know what you think, so I'd love to see your comments on this and what your opinions are on the list. You know, like I said, I had some other problems with the list. I won't jump into all of them for the sake of your time, but I cannot stop myself from mentioning how Floyd Mayweather fell at number fell to number eight and was listed at number eight. How does an undefeated boxer, undefeated boxer, with 50 wins... On his resume. E.B., he only deserves 49. The 50th was against, uh, what's that Irishman's name? Oh, yeah, Conor McGregor. Okay, fine. I'll give you that. Say he's 49-0. and 0. He was undefeated with 49 matches. 49 W's under his belt, if you will. So, I don't understand how someone that goes in of all sports boxing undefeated for 49 matches isn't in the top five, let alone the top three. So, you know, that was my other major problem with it. And then like the obvious ones that were mentioned in Peter Keating's rebuttal article or follow-up article on his list, like where's Michael Phelps? How is he not even anywhere on the list at all? And then the other thing that no one else mentioned, but came to my mind, was where I'm, I was kind of surprised to see there was no extreme sports athletes on the list at all, not a one. And now I don't know if that's because of the revenue they bring in, you know, uh, yearly or whatever, and it doesn't meet their criteria to be included. I think their threshold was like a hundred mil per sport. So I don't know if those sports like, you know, dirt bike racing, um, freestyle dirt biking, and skateboarding, you know, sports like that, BMX, sports like that. I don't know if they didn't meet the threshold or what, but I'd say where there there were some dominant athletes in those sports. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, and, and that's again why I'm not a huge fan of lists like these, because there's always going to be a problem with them. There's just no way around it. I guess it's just a matter of how few problems people end up having with your list that make it a good one. <laughs> I, I've yet to see an airtight list like this, but hey. That That's just me, and I guess my opinion. And I know a lot of you would agree with it. I know that. So, all right, I think this is a good place to wrap it up for this week's show. Thanks for watching, guys. Once again, please, please subscribe. It really helps us out a lot. It helps out the channel a lot when you subscribe. Uh, drop some comments. I, I respond to every comment. I love interfacing with you guys. Love to hear what you think, always. And I think that's a good time to end it. EB signing off.